In the summer of 2024, I traveled to Copenhagen, Denmark to visit Copenhagen Atomics, a startup company aiming to revolutionize the nuclear industry by mass-producing thorium-powered molten salt reactors. In part one, we explored the specifics of this technology and the promise of thorium. Here in part two, we will dive deeper into the challenges of bringing a new nuclear reactor to market. But first, a quick refresher. When you hear the term molten salt reactor, you might be thinking of molten table salt. Well, they're not using table salt here, but it's actually pretty close to the truth. You see, chemically speaking, a salt is just any metal bonded to another element through chemical processes. NaCl is table salt. This will eventually be a salt of uranium or a salt of thorium. This isn't actually thorium or else I'd be getting irradiated, but this is a stand-in to show people what it would look like. It's kind of like table salt, except it's a lot finer and a lot more pure. Now, when this becomes molten, there are specific advantages. Principle among them, you can work with molten salt at a much higher temperature than you can work with water at. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. You can work with molten salt at 700 degrees Celsius. And it just happens to be thermodynamically true that at a higher temperature, you get better power efficiency. There's been a renewed interest in molten salt reactors all around the world, from Idaho to China, but the technology is much older than this interest implies. And at least according to Copenhagen Atomics, the reason why there isn't a single commercial thorium reactor is more personal than professional. You might know that there was an experimental reactor back in the 60s, uh, 1965 to 1969, in the US at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and that was designed by a guy called Elvin Weinberg, Elvin Weinberg was one of the uh, most important or most influential people in the nuclear industry. He ran something called the Oak Ridge Reactor School, where almost all reactor ideas or concepts that has ever been invented, they were discussed in that reactor school. Uh, he was also part of making the very first reactor for the submarine Nautilus really early on. So he was part of designing uh, the very first light water reactors. And it made a lot of sense to put a light water reactor in a submarine. But then later on, they just scaled it up and used it for energy production uh, on land. But he already said, said back in the 1950s that this was a bad idea. There was other reactor designs that was better. And one of his favorite reactor designs was this molten salt reactor. And then it, it, finally he got money to build one and test it in the 1960s. Uh, but un unfortunately in the end, he was fired because he disagreed with the people in Washington about how the like, budgets should be used and so on. And that's very unfortunate because then that whole research on molten salt reactors was stopped. And, uh, and then for many, many years, there was very little research. And it was not until 2006 or something like that, that there was people starting looking at it again and the, who really liked this idea and say, why didn't we, why did we stop in the 60s? Why didn't we continue this research? Because it's clear when you look at the physics and the engineering, there's some great opportunities here. There's a possibility of having better reactors and lower cost and safer systems and something that can be mass manufactured. While Dr. Weinberg may have figured out everything theoretically, there's still a lot of work to be done practically, even decades later. Copenhagen Atomics is hard at work on the private side, and countries like China are building MSRs on the public side. But to date, no one has solved the so-called technology gaps that make molten salt reactors, thorium or otherwise, so appealing in the first place. No one has built a working molten breeder, which produces more fuel than it uses. No one has made the inline fuel reprocessor, which removes the fission products from the liquid fuel during operation, extending the fuel's life and reducing nuclear waste. According to a 2015 report by Energy Process Developments Limited, the first step in bringing MSRs to market is to have reactors that do not breed new fuel, that do not require inline fuel reprocessing, and use the well-established enriched uranium fuel cycle instead of something like thorium. This doesn't mean that the technology is dead, just that companies like Copenhagen Atomics and countries like China are aiming to prove the easier stuff first. To its credit, Copenhagen Atomics does seem ahead of the curve on thorium, they began this project over a decade ago and are one of the few private companies that have actually solved some of the design challenges in metal, not paper. Copenhagen Atomics was started 10 years ago and it was our opinion right from the beginning 
that we should make them fairly small so they can be mass manufactured. We, we scrambled a little bit in the beginning to get enough money and we just started building things. And we knew right from the beginning we could not start day one to build a reactor, that's too difficult. So we built sort of all the subsystems with molten salt because there is a whole technology step in order to get the, the molten salt technology to, to be advanced enough to handle that. We did that and now we've been doing that for yeah almost 10 years and we're the only company so far that have built full-scale reactor prototypes for molten salt and we're testing them every day. To make a molten salt reactor work, the only moving part or the only rotating part inside the reactor is the pump. It's not super easy to make a pump that can run in this environment with very high radiation, both gamma and, and neutron radiation, very high temperature, six to 700 degrees, and also these salts that are corrosive, and you know they will corrode most metals and most materials. When we started 10 years ago, there was nowhere anywhere in the world that you could buy a pump for fluoride salts at high temperature. Uh, and, um, and now there are sort of uh, three or four companies trying to make pumps. We are one of them. Uh, we have made a unique design where the, the motor, the electrical motor of the pump, can run at 700 degrees. So basically it's glowing red hot while it's running. This has never been done before, at, le at least as far as we can find out. And we are succeeding, we are ahead of the others right now. Not everything is solved though. Since molten radioactive salts are still salts, corrosion is one of the biggest obstacles for all of this red hot plumbing. If you have lived near an ocean, you know that salt can be highly, highly corrosive. So you can imagine if you're working with 700 degree molten salt, that can corrode everything that you're working with. Pipes, pumps, all of that. It has hindered a lot of molten salt technology. Here's an example. If you have just a normal sample of stainless steel, it hasn't been touched by any of this hot salt yet. This is what happens after it has been worked over by the hot salt. As you can see, if you want to run a nuclear reactor for any amount of time, you have to solve this problem. What's really exciting about Copenhagen Atomics is that applying their processes, it looks like they may have done just that. There's, of course, making a pump work and making it work for many years without service because it's, it's nearly impossible to make service inside this highly radioactive environment. The next problem is to uh, handle the corrosion. Uh, back in the 1960s when they run the molten reactor experiment, they used a material called Hasloy N, which is a nickel-based alloy, and it's a little bit more resistant to corrosion, but it's also much more expensive, sort of in the order of 50 times more expensive than stainless steel. And uh, we had the good fortune that uh, one of the professors at our university, the Techn Technical University of Denmark, he used to work at Oak Ridge back in the 60s and 70s on molten salts. In all those years, he, he had a group working on corrosion and, and molten salts. And we are really proud to sort of stand on the, their shoulders and, and build on the stuff they did. And that meant that uh, really early on, Coming Atomics was able to get some impressive results with removing some of the corrosive problems from the salt so that we can use uh, materials of lower cost, for example, stainless steel. And of course, you can imagine if you can build the whole reactor out of, of materials that are uh, 50 times less expensive, uh, that is important. And this allow us to design reactors with less expensive materials. And therefore also we can get energy price down and we can mass manufacture it more easily. Those difficulties aside, um, the inherent sort of additional uh, difficulties with molten salt reactors are like the high temperature. So there's not really an industry that provides the components. If you were to build another reactor at a much lower temperature, you could source many of the components. So that's sort of an additional hurdle that you have to overcome. But that has also been part of the mode of why it hasn't been done before, I think. So you have to get the funding to go through that initial development to sort of reach the other side. 10 years worth of work on red hot pumps, corrosive salts, and radioactive liquid has apparently paid off in a big way. Copenhagen Atomics is one of the few places in the world with a working prototype of their technology. 
Decades-old designs, engineering challenges, and physics all culminates in this, one of the very few working prototypes of a molten salt reactor in the world. Right now, it's running just water through it to prove all of its gizmos and gadgets. But in the near future, hopefully, Copenhagen Atomics will have molten salt of thorium and uranium coursing through its stainless steel veins. Inside, you have multiple shells separating heavy water, thorium, and uranium that creates this sustained fission reaction. The advantage of having all of this in molten form is that you can constantly circulate nuclear fuel in and out, and you can take out all the fission products as they're being generated. This allows for a much more energy-dense operation than your typical light water reactor, and it would also generate less nuclear waste. This bad boy can fit so much thorium in it, you wouldn't believe. I probably shouldn't have smacked it like that. Copenhagen Atomics claims to be one of the only companies with working prototypes for many systems. But to be clear, they haven't actually gotten their hands on any thorium yet. That requires applications and licenses and partners, and that's what comes next. Some of the next big milestones is we've, we've had in the applications for handling uh, thorium and uranium at this site and started to do, not start a reactor, but just using those salts and manufacturing these salts. Uh, a little bit further down the road, we want to start the first reactor and uh, we've made a, an agreement in Switzerland where we can test the first reactor uh, and that's going to be in 2026 and 27. So it's really important for us to, to get that up and running and show that it actually works like we say it does. After that, of course, we have to move forward and start doing commercial deployment. And, um, and that's again a question, you know, what are the best countries for deploying these new type of reactors? And uh, we've already noticed through these last five years that it's uh, um, being allowed to deploy a new type of nuclear, nuclear technology is, is not straightforward, <laughs> especially not in some countries. In some countries, I would say it's almost impossible. <laughs> uh, but of course, there are almost 200 countries, so I'm, I'm pretty sure there will be uh, a handful that will be very willing to test this new technology as the first ones. I would say that we've reduced maybe more than half the risk, but the amount of work, we're still a lot of work to be done. We also expect the team to grow and the industry to grow. We're planning to do a test reactor to sort of de-risk the technology without going to a commercial stage where there's like a lot higher stakes of being able to deliver energy at a cost effective. Uh, point on a startup funding budget as opposed to a like nation state budget. A government program this is not, and it can't be. Denmark isn't nuclear. In 1985, the Danish parliament passed a resolution that no nuclear power plants would be built in the country. But Copenhagen Atomics wants to move on thorium reactors right now, at scale, everywhere. So they're getting creative. Yeah, let's think big, right? So, uh, of course, we, we know today that uh, the total world uh, uses uh, tw 20 terawatt hours worth of uh, energy. And 80% uh, of that comes from coal, oil and gas. And there's a little bit, 1% from wind and 1% from solar and some from hydro and almost 5% from nuclear energy. And sort of, w we should think forward the rest of our lives, how do we want that pie to look in 2050 and 2070 and so on. In 2100, uh, I believe that half of all energy that humans consume will come from thorium energy. And the reason I believe that is because price is king, <laughs> as they say, uh, and I think thorium energy can provide energy at a much lower price than any other energy technology. I think it will become the most important energy technology of this century. The end goal of all of this work, the true promise of thorium, at least according to Copenhagen Atomics, is something like what you see behind me. Maybe two dozen nuclear reactors using molten salt to provide clean, safe energy and a gigawatt of it all in the space of maybe a Walmart or two. The enthusiasm at a startup like this is palpable. The idea of bringing an old technology into a new era has brought a lot of people together. Everywhere you look, intelligent, skilled, young scientists, engineers, and technicians. I studied theoretical physics and sort of uh, didn't see any exciting avenues to sort of go in that industry. It seems like all the cool stuff was done uh, back in the 40s and 50s. 
uh, and I sort of stumbled upon molten salt reactors and saw like that is a really cool technology that it doesn't seem like enough people are like working on solving that. So that's how I got interested in like, oh, this is actually like a field where you can as an individual have a significant impact. I think our average age is just below 30. I think it has to do with that it's new technology and it's exciting, it's changing the world, it has, it's part of the green transition or revolution. I think a lot of the technology itself, even if it was not nuclear, the materials, the systems, the technology here is very exciting to work with that and, and try to solve some of the problems we're solving here. Like if you want to be part of something that can change the world, that is usually appealing to young risk taking and like maker type go do it yourself individuals. So that's naturally what people who graduate, uh, like, uh, like get attracted to our project and the people we end up hiring. If you look at human history for the last, I don't know, 500 years or 200 years, uh, you see how the changes that were made usually came from young people who had sort of this, we want to make some change, we want to you know, make a dent in the world. <laughs> but I think we have a huge opportunity in the market that, that nobody else went for molten salt reactors and thorium. And I think that technology has a huge potential. The, the mold, most dangerous energy technology we have is coal-fired power plants. And it's expected that it kills roughly a million people every year. So, you know, since we had, we started having nuclear energy 70 years ago. So, here's a quick calculation, that's 70 million people. That is more people than died in the Second World War. And, and it's like we're not even allowed to discuss it. We need, like, many, much more than double the amount of nuclear reactors. Uh, like, today, nuclear provides 5% of global energy. I think it's realistic to see that to 50% within like my lifetime. Will our future really be powered by thorium? Is this element actually worthy? For their part, Copenhagen Atomics has made significant strides in areas that no one else has in 60 years. Whatever the future of nuclear power may be, it seems like it's bright. And I wish them all the best. Until next time.